<clears throat> okay, recording in progress, got it. Um, it's the realization that the way we've managed cities has been inefficient. The way we've managed, uh, it tends to be very centralized, particularly in the last 30 years. Uh, actually, the introduction of early source of AI, these types of management systems by companies, banks, hospitals, cities, uh, governments, has meant a centralization of decision making. And in some ways, it's better because it's based on data and so forth, but it disempowered all the communities. And it had another problem, which was that whenever you make a uniform law, that means you have disadvantaged communities that are not absolutely standard. So you may have advantaged some while disadvantaging others. So you'd really like to have much more local control of things like healthcare, education, trash, <laughs> the police, whatever, uh, investment, because every neighborhood is different. And, uh, and that's one of the, the major themes here is decentralizing uh, this AI, this control over data, control over your environment. And so um, I think I've already mentioned that, you know, I ran a group at Davos that uh, resulted in GDPR, um, so the, you know, the justice minister of the EU and the head of the equivalent in the U.S. were members of the group, as was, you know, the CTO of Microsoft and Citibank and so forth. Um, and I'm on the board of directors for the UN Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So these are some of the, the, the larger scale things I do, but let's talk about the smaller scale. So the fundamental problem today about many of these things is that people don't trust the data and AI economy to act in their interest. And all the attention is focused on people like Google and Facebook. But the same is true of your hospital system. The same is true of your city government. You don't know what data they have about you. And you don't know what decisions they're making. And a lot of the decisions they make are poor uh, and not in your interest. And so this is a fundamental problem of having to do with who owns the data. So in everything that I'm saying here, I want you to like remember one little sentence, which is AI is only patterns and data. If you control the data, you control the AI. Okay, that's it. All this hype about AI and general intelligence and stuff is all BS. I've been in this game for a long time. I have the chair, uh, the, the down chair I hold was from the guy who named artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky. It's just patterns and data. And uh, so you need to focus on the data, who owns it, and what's being done with it. So people need to be able to control and trust in the outcomes that are done by these systems, which means they need to control the data. And that maybe is the fundamental message here. So we need a new deal on data. We need to specify how things are owned and used. GDPR is a step in that direction, but only a step. Okay. So um, as I explained before the recording happened, um, one of the things that uh, is key is now that data is seen as a new means of production like money, like land, like labor. And um, you know, so I mentioned that Xi, the head of China, says this regularly, and I've written about it for a long time. And just think about if we had just invented money for the first time, we'd be in a terrible state with it, right? Uh, you need institutions to control it, to make sure that people aren't defrauded, et cetera, that there's ownership, that there's accountability. And the same is true now of data. If it's that important part of our economy, of our, of our life, we need identity, ownership, audit, and accountability. And the solution that I see is through credit unions and data unions, just like we did with money. Um, and, and the reason for having this a community-based institution, uh, and incidentally, in most countries in the world, credit unions are already chartered by law to manage data. They just don't. They do it a little bit. So you don't need new laws. What you need is you need a business model 
that empowers, incentivizes credit unions to also be data unions. So why communities? Well, I mentioned a couple of them. One is that this is very complicated. This is like investing money. You know, you, you say, well, there's, I'll let my data be used here, but you actually don't know the effects of that. It's very difficult to know. Um, and that has to do with all the externalities. If you let these people use your data, then what happens in this other place that you hadn't even thought was connected? So you, it's good to have someone helping you manage, a fiduciary, like a lawyer or accountant, right? Um, I mentioned regulation. If you make uniform laws, that means that poor communities are probably left out, right? Because they're different, they have different needs. Rich communities may make out like bandits because they have different capabilities. So one size fits none, which will be familiar to everybody in the EU as a little phrase. Uh, and one thing about having sort of uniform regulation is that implies, mathematically implies, marginalization of unusual uh, communities. And it's probably for these reasons why as we introduced uh, labor regulation, sort of when factories came in, beginning of the 1900s, it was local unions, local gatherings, that fought back and established worker rights over their labor. Similarly, as money became something that was in common use, uh, for instance, in the US in the sort of late 1800s, um, what you saw was the rise of local banks, agricultural banks particularly, that pushed back against the big city banks. And that, in both cases, led to uh, federal level, high level regulation and sort of established guidelines, but there was control locally. And of course, over the last century or so, this has gotten centralized, so it's no longer as, as good as it was. But that's how things happen in human society. It starts local. And so credit unions, labor unions. What, what sort of data do these people need to be able to have local control? Well, obviously statistics like, like census data. How many people live here? What's the average wage? How many kids? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also you need flows of people. So these are not things that are personal data any more than census data is personal data. It's like where do people work? in this neighborhood? Where do they shop? Who comes to this neighborhood for dinner or for work? It turns out that the patterns of cities are extremely predictable once you know these sorts of flows. So this is something that is uh, originally called social physics, a name that came from uh, the French Enlightenment originally, and then was picked up in, in UK next, and then now this is why we have a census everywhere, uh, is this notion that you need some sort of data to be able to govern. And uh, if you look at actual human behavior, if you're trying to do things like predict gentrification, wealth creation, disease propagation, it's the flows of people that matter, not the individual level data. That's pretty obvious in some cases. So for instance, um, this is work we did uh, for the UN Secretary General, who's one of his data revolutionaries, uh, trying to figure out how data could help the UN achieve the sustainable development uh, goals. And it turns out by looking at these flows, you can, for instance, let's take public health. Obviously, a lot of diseases uh, move with people. People are the vectors. So if you know the flows of people, you can predict where the disease goes next. Uh, at, it's sort of obvious, right? But in most places, you don't know these flows, so you can't predict, right? It's crazy. And in particular, the community can't take action to make itself uh, better, more um, resilient. Similarly, infrastructure. So these are all from Senegal, where we did a, a test case for the whole nation. Uh, you know, if you want to know where the buses should go, you need to know where people need to go. What transportation people do today is they optimize existing ridership, existing commutership. So that is to say the people who are privileged to have the right transportation get it even better. But those communities that don't have good uh, uh, transportation 
are left off of that optimization. What you really need to do is you need to say, look, every community needs to be able to get to work, get to good food, and get their kids to school. How are we going to do that? And that requires data. And in fact, if you take that attitude of providing uh, transportation for people to live their life the best way, you find you get very different transportation infrastructure. The buses go in very different places than they would if you just optimized the current system. Um, similarly, that drives investment. You can figure out what sort of places are likely uh, to be good investments. So for instance, we've built tools, which I'll show you in a minute, that allow entrepreneurs, small business people, to answer questions like, well, if I set up a, 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 a infant care uh, facility here, will it be used? If I set up a, a food stall here, will it be used? To answer those questions, you need to know who goes by the front door. Where are they coming from? What sort of trip are they on? You don't need to know who they are. You just need to know, you know, in the case of supermarket, that there's a lot of people that go by this place on their way home or live right nearby. And if you know those things, then you can actually figure out that that's a good place to put it and it will likely be successful. And these statistics are good enough that you can get much cheaper loans, much cheaper financing to be able to build your supermarket or whatever uh, because you know about the likely uh, uh, clientele that you have. And you can also measure poverty and inequality. It turns out that there's lots of things that are uh, indices of, of poverty and inequality, not just money. People's behavior becomes very different. Um, so in neighborhoods that have very few people visiting, that have uh, uh, very little flow out, so they're, they're sort of like ghettos, are invariably poor. The ones that are poor like that, so they're not connected to the rest of the city, that transportation is very difficult, and the only places they interact with are other sort of ghettos, are also the ones that are most at risk of crime. So you can actually predict uh, crime frequency from patterns of flows between neighborhoods. All this is under this title, Social Physics. I have a book called Social Physics. You can buy it online, <laughs> it's like $12 US, something like that, you should, you should read it. Um, and so one of the things you can do is just sort of think about this is, you know, today we have these ESG metrics, right? For environmental, social, governance. And they're frankly idiocy. They, there's several commercial versions of this. They don't agree with each other. They don't really capture what you care about. But if you can actually measure using these sorts of aggregate census-like statistics, then you can build real ESG things. Like, does this really help people, or is it just sort of a greenwash? And that would be interesting because all those trillions of dollars of investment would move to your metric as opposed to the ones that they know aren't good but are good advertising. So just think about that. You could actually get a huge synergy there where investors want to do things that are socially valuable. There's trillions of dollars there, but they don't have any way to do it because they don't have the data. You can provide data through these sort of community organizations. Um, so what does this actually look like concretely? Well. The sort of core idea here is that you don't share data, period. So when we think about data, we think about making a big data lake. This is stupid, okay? Because it tells all the bad guys where <laughs> you can go to steal it. Moreover, you can't really account for where the data is going. If it's all in there, God knows what they're doing. So what we've done is we've set up systems where you ask questions of data holders. So you ask the hospital, how many people in this neighborhood have diabetes? You ask the government, where do the buses go and what's the ridership? And they just give back aggregate statistics, which are not individual data. Don't get all balled up in the minutia of, of GDPR. It's not. And, and if you don't like some of the little details, there are simple methods you can use to make sure that it's not, to 
provably make sure it's not. Now, what's interesting here is we've been able to convince people in the US to be able to move this. And in fact, right now, we've got uh, the majority of bank accounts in the United States are done this way. So when you get credit and other sorts of, many of the decisions, it's no longer requires sharing data. What happens is the person who's going to give you the loan or whatever, just ask the bank, is this guy a good credit risk? And the bank says yes or no. It doesn't tell them anything about what much money you have, how much money you earn, blah, 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 any of that. So we've moved to this in some of the basic systems. Eurostat has adapted this. So I worked with Eurostat for some years. There's a video of me the, the EU presidency invited me to come help them do this. And, and, and so they've moved to this because uh, a lot of the law uh, in Europe says you can't move data out of the country. So how do you create aggregate statistics? Well, this is how you do it. You have aggregate statistics and you share those, you don't share the original data. It's just a very small mindset change, but it turns out it's much safer, protects privacy, and uh, it's actually also cheaper, which is not unimportant. So we've done this in several places. For instance, with the help of the Inter-American Development Bank, we set up uh, systems that are a little like this for auditing uh, social programs in Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. So we've been able to look at whether those systems are fair, inclusive, and adapt them because you can see the statistics going back and forth. So you can design systems to balance the inequality set or balance or maximize the reach. When you have something where all the data is in one pool, you can never really quite trust that it's being done correctly. But if this is something is just census-like statistics, um, then you can begin sort of auditing them and asking questions that you care about, like is this actually equitable or is this actually inclusive? And what we found unsurprisingly, of course, was in Colombia, uh, they had over 20% errors in who got social support. Uh, so almost a million people were getting money that shouldn't have gotten money, and almost a million people that should have gotten money weren't. So we were able to help them to change their rules to, to make their social systems much more effective using this sort of technology. Um, we have an online tool. You can sort of see an alpha version of this. It's not really a, 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 a serious tool yet. Um, but what it does is it uses these principles. And the example we have is a city in Australia, which has been a collaborator of ours. So uh, using data, these are on census blocks. So they're about neighborhoods. They're not about individuals. And just to sort of show you an example, so this is, you can see the city down there around the sort of central bay. It's where all the, the census blocks get smaller and smaller. Oh, there's not a lot of people in Australia, so some of those things that are huge actually only have very few people, uh, a few thousand. Um, so what we can do is we can look at particular places and begin to look, for instance, at what sort of facilities they have. What sort of points of interest do they have? Grocery stores, uh, clinics, daycare, entertainment. And so these are all the points of interest. This is pretty clearly not individual data. But it tells you about what uh, the environment is like if you're going to set up another restaurant, or if you're going to set up a business, or if you're going to uh, facilitate transportation of various sorts. You see there's all sorts of things like that one street that has uh, like a million little restaurants on it and so forth. So you're familiar with this. But this is a way to really look at it. Now that's pretty familiar with it. You can do things like this, not quite this, this detailed and uh, quite this sort of thing on, on Google, for instance. But you can also then use this data together with flows of people. Where do the people in this neighborhood work? Where do they shop? Who goes to this other neighborhood? to be able to do things that are useful um, to, for instance, people who are starting small businesses or trying to grow their small business. So what we have is a bunch of information about the age of residents, the population growth of this area, all these things that would be useful for a small business. 
And then we use a lot of this social physics to be able to predict things, like what's the income likely to grow in this area or not? Is the um, what what are some of the, the resilience to economic downturns, et cetera, et cetera? All of these things we can predict using this sort of social physics uh, math uh, on the flows. And so what you can end up doing is you can end up looking at all the pieces that you want. This is from the sort of aggregated data. And then you can begin comparing neighborhoods. If you say some neighborhoods here are getting better, some are getting worse. And those are the things that go into decisions about uh, starting a new facility of some sort. Um, and um, you can cut this in various ways, and we're experimenting with this. So this is an advisory tool that says, you know, what sort of business are you thinking of doing? Who are going to be your customers? How many of the people you're going to employ? Uh, so on and so forth. And then what it does is, uh, it having gone through some of this sort of basics for um, uh, understanding what the proposed business is, it goes and it uses these sort of social physics things to be able to understand what neighborhoods might be good. And here's a four top neighborhoods. And you can see how all of the things change over time and then decide which neighborhood is best for you to, to start a store. So, um, and obviously you can also use this for community awareness. We do carbon footprint, health score. So in the pandemic, um, death rates were almost entirely a function of health score, like, for instance, age, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular was a smaller factor. But nobody knows those statistics in their neighborhood. I mean, this is crazy. So here are the things that are, you know, the strongest predictors of death, and you don't know what your neighborhood is like. So that means you can't take action based on your neighborhood. In fact, it's very difficult to know this even for an entire city. Uh, the health people don't want to release this sort of data. But yet, this is exactly what you need to do if you're going to save lives. On and on and on. It's the control of the data that allows you to have good governance, as it always has been for the last two centuries, and I think it always will be in the future. And you need to have that, a way of doing this, which everybody will participate in, preserves privacy, and gives control, in my view, to the community so that they can make decisions which are best from their point of view. Um, that's the book, Building the Economy, MIT Press, and I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thanks so much. I did, I did good. 25 minutes, right to the minute, right? That's so, perfect. The timing is really perfect. Thanks so much, Sandy. Okay. Um, well, if you have any questions you would like to ask, sorry for this. Uh, I, as usual, you can like virtually raise your hand and then uh, directly ask uh, ask Sandy. Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's go with uh, Ud. I guess you're here. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Alex Pifflin, for you for your pitch. It was very interesting, and I also watch um, the YouTube video about social uh, physics and all good ideas spread. Um, I had a question more related to the virtual world and um, the role of social media in, in how this new economic will shape. So you speak a lot about the spatial of the city and the census data, but how social media is changing maybe the pattern that, we, that we're seeing, um, if you have done any research on that. Yeah, we've done uh, uh, research on that. and. What we looked at was stratification and uh, uh, echo chambers, basically. And what it turns out is if you look at social media, um, poor people talk to poor people, rich people mm -hmm. talk to rich people, they don't talk to each other. Middle class people talk to middle class. Same is true of shopping, uh, mm -hmm. even if you control for price. There's just, you know, uh, yes, people walk past each other on the street, but they don't talk to each other. And so social media has done a lot less uh, to mix ideas in the city mm -hmm. than you would think. And um, one of the things that's, I think, really bad, a 
about social media and things like that is that uh, there's a tendency nowadays for us to think about only solutions in the digital domain. Oh, we're going to make a website for it. We're going to make a social media deal. But that's actually a very, uh, that's a much smaller part of your actual life and your actual experience. And even of the decisions you make, it's more the people around you. Like, for instance, if you're going to predict weight gain, it's not the people you talk to. It's the people you share an environment with. If you're going to predict, uh, predict uh, political views, it's not the people you talk to that have good, good predictions. It's the people that you know you work with, live with, etc., that that are better predictors. And so people forget about the physical. But of course, the physical is where kids get educated, people get sick, uh, uh, they get jobs, and stuff like that. So, um, you know. I think that social media has uh, has many problems, but one of them is it forgets most of life, right? And most of life is uh, actually still the driving concern, including um, who talks to whom. So, yeah, Bob. Hey, uh, I'm Gabor. Uh, I'm um, an IoT engineer at Google in Taiwan. And um, I want to ask you more about these data unions. I've heard this proposal of decentralized governance a number of times. And I suppose you, for, you already worked on a small pilot in Australia, probably had discussions with credit unions. And I was wondering, from these discussions, what are the top business and scaling issues that prevent us from having data unions right now? Well, um, so we also work with people like consumer union and credit unions and things like that. Um, the top, the top things are probably two. One is, um, you know, people. There's been so much about evil data, right, and evil AI, that people don't want to listen to uh, what you're thinking about doing, right? They don't want to think about anything having to do with this. If they do think about it, they've been brainwashed to think about it in terms of money. So, you know, oh, yes, you could get money from Google for advertising, right, for using my data. Well, if you look at that, it's like a couple hundred bucks a year. It's okay. Uh, but if I had control of my data, I could save my kid's life because I could get them better medical help. Now, which do you want to do? Save your kids? Get a couple hundred bucks. It's obvious, right? But people are so focused on the money that they're willing to let, you know, the government get away with things, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is this public acceptance of it. Um, and then there's the uh, value proposition. So, for instance, people that are more receptive to this are people like gig workers. Gig workers can form unions with their data to get earn more money. Earn more money is a very short-term, immediate type of thing. So they're much more receptive to it. We find that one of the reasons I was mentioning small businesses is small business people, you know, who are starting any sort of thing. Um, are very focused on, in the short term, what can I do to be better? And if you can give them better financing, better prediction of economic success, um, that's something that they'll do, even if it's unfamiliar and a little bit uncomfortable. So, so you need a value proposition that's very short term, safe feeling, um, and you need to be also be able to generate enough money off of that that you can afford to deploy it and scale it. And so that's really the, the key. And the things that we look at are things like, um, you know, people who are want to earn more money or better money, better working conditions, people who are trying to start small businesses, people who um, want to have better services for their kids. Those are all things that people will actually change their behavior about. And, and that's, that's where you start. Excuse me for going on, but you know, like for instance, think about labor unions. 
labor unions started locally, not globally, right? They started locally to make more money, right? To make, you know, better facilities for their tenants. Very focused type of a thing. And then they expanded over time to safety, working hours, blah, 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 blah. But they started with this really, you know, concrete type of a thing. And I think the same thing needs to happen with, uh, with data. Thank you for the answer. Is that what you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, amazing insights. Uh, I have actually two questions, one related to, uh, especially, specifically to the project that you show, you, show us, uh, one about the methodology and one about the, rest, the outcomes that the project has. First, uh, the projects in Australia that you show us, uh, how did you get the data and how accurate it was? Because of course, uh, you can get this type of data from platforms like Google or OpenStreetMaps, but uh, to a certain extent, it's not that accurate to the reality, as you mentioned, to the physical world. So I, my question was, to what extent is this, uh, or what percentage of accuracy this has? And my second question was about the results. So if you have a platform where you advise to certain business or where they have to be located, that I think is an, an awesome idea, but it, it gathers information from the same city uh, that have certain patterns. For example, a uh, certain zone of, of the city is very poor. Oh, yeah, so obviously, if you have a small budget, perhaps you can be there. And another city, uh, part of the city that is very rich, patterns of, are very rich uh, stores. Uh, if you have a big, uh, a big budget, you can be there. But uh, to what extent? Uh, you can uh, create with this algorithm something different, like change the patterns of, of the of the city. So, That's my question. So, so the data that uh, for your data is of somewhat variable quality in different parts of the world, but at this point in time, um, most sort of mid-income and up countries have quite adequate data. It has some biases, but I'll tell you. It's a lot better than no data. <laughs> okay. I mean, like light years better than no data, uh, which is what most people do. So take this small business. So if you were completely, uh, you know, I just have to make this business, I don't really care it is. Yeah, you'd probably put it in a rich area without a lot of competition, but you'd still use the data to say, this doesn't have a lot of competition. Let's imagine that it's a childcare thing. This doesn't have a lot of competition. The right people walk by the door. This is a good location. But if you also had a, a, a social mission, you'd say, I'd rather put it over here in, in my neighborhood where I live. Um, but from the financing point of view, the bank or other people look at that and say, yeah, but that's a poor neighborhood. So you're going to have to pay a lot more money in interest because of your outcomes uncertain. And if you can go back to that bank and say, no, 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 no. I, I can tell you all these reasons, all this like actual data that show that I'm likely to be successful, then they will give you cheaper financing. They'll give you more ability to do things and you're more likely to be successful. Um, so, so it's leveling the field that way, right? Um, and maybe not completely, one of the other things you can do, of course, is you can do policy. You can say, okay, based on this data, we see that you need more childcare here, and you can make a better economic argument with the data than without the data, but um, it's still not even equal to the thing in the rich neighborhood. So we, the city, is going to have a policy that subsidizes childcare in this area to make it equal, right? But you can't do that without data, right? <laughs> you need to know where there's problems and how much the problems are. And um, again, I think that having a centralized management of it is generally a poor idea. You can have guardrails, general policies, central, that's fine. Uh, you know, don't kill anybody. <laughs> you know, make sure the kids are okay, whatever. But 
But the decisions about exactly what you should do, I think, should be in the hands of the people that are experiencing it, in other words, local. Thank you very much. Tony? Hi, Alex. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. I'm Saula from Lithuania. And mm -hmm. uh, it was really relevant for me what you talk uh, about Atlas uh, for the for opportunities. Because last year I ran a small consultancy startup which was focusing on advising companies where they should open in order to, to be more successful, let's put it this mm -hmm. way. Yeah. And what I found um, uh, nice was that we were able to uh, give these advices for, for big companies, for companies that already understand the power of the data. And we are also able to advise um, uh, city governments because they also understand uh, they were also providing us the data so they already had some challenges quite clearly stated but what I found mostly difficult is to um, to get to attract small companies small businesses because uh, most of them if there's for example a neighbor that decided to open a flower shop or coffee shop or whatever they are not <laughs> very very much advanced let's say in, in data and in all these data platforms so most often uh, when we were uh, trying to, to get this group of clients because we're interested in small businesses and putting them uh, in, the, in the right place, because I, I know that gas station probably will make the right decision and earn a lot of money or big supermarket, but we were interested about small businesses. And what I found very difficult is how to track those. And I was also interested if, if you measured some uh, through your Atlas for opportunity, if you measured the impact, if you actually reached out to, to small businesses, if it made impact on those. So um, what you're describing is essentially a, uh, a data and AI literacy problem. So local, I mean, schools don't teach this. Um, it's not part of the common dialogue. It's seen as being only sort of, you know, elite, you know, programmer types. We ran a course for the government of Canada that was for plumbers and carpenters and people like that and point out to them that they all have contact lists and order books and all and it's usually an excel spreadsheet and if they put those together across businesses they could do a lot better than if they did it alone that's exactly what we're talking about so we taught that course and 15 percent of the people in the course these are plumbers and contractors and stuff actually started new businesses or uh, you know revise their business to be able to do this which I think is a you know huge success it's amazing because it isn't it, despite all the hype about it the fundamentals are not complicated right? it's very you know are there people going to walk by the door are the people in the neighborhood are they the people that are going to buy you know I mean this is pretty straightforward um, and if you're not scared you have to not be scared by graphs and numbers, which is a problem in most societies. Uh, so that's a literacy type of a problem. Um, in terms of what we've done, um, you know, the things I showed you are relatively new. So I can't really claim that there's a long track record. Some of the simpler ones do have track records. So for instance, we work with a group that has been helping existing uh, uh, credit unions, existing cooperatives uh, for almost 30 years. And what they do is they provide data and advice to the cooperatives, right? Uh, because cooperatives don't have the expertise. But by talking to a network of cooperatives, you can have people with expertise to be able to help each one of them. And eventually, the, the cooperatives become more sophisticated, right? So it's not an easy thing, but, uh, uh, you know, you're looking for low-hanging fruit that have immediate um, urgency about them so that people will get out of their normal way of business and, you know, try it. And once they've tried it, they discover, oh, this isn't that complicated. And a lot of it is very common sense, right? So it's not like it's, you know, alien stuff from outer space, deep learning, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and it's important not to confuse the super advanced stuff and all the hype about AI with the practical matter of 
making neighborhoods better. Right? You know, it, it's not that complicated, right? There is math behind it, but you don't have to get into all that, right? Thank you. Ruth? Hello. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Ruth. Um, I'm doing a PhD at TU Delft on urban inequality. And my, my question is a little bit similar to, to Gustavo's. Um, I'm just going to contextualize it. At one point, you were talking about transport and how transport interventions are often, are often done in areas that already have uh, transport and uh, are done to optimize sort of existing conditions. And from my understanding with big infrastructure like that, it's often public private sort of partnerships. And basically the reason why um, you know, these existing networks are optimized as opposed to reaching out to areas which don't have infrastructure is that there's less risk, basically. Um, there's, uh, whereas in the poorer areas, there's more risk, from my understanding. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, using data to kind of um, build a financial model that sort of encourages this um, sort of reaching out to, to areas which uh, are, are kind of considered to be more high risk, um, are generally your poorer areas. Um. Um, so, so there are two ways we come at it. So one way is, you know, you talk to the people in charge of the transportation network or like the city, the sort of stakeholders, and you say, look, what's the whole point of the, this transportation thing anyhow? Oh, it's like, so that people can make money and pay taxes. So so that we can buy infrastructure or blah, blah, blah. Well, what if I gave you an easy way that's very, very good for getting votes um, to make your city more prosperous? It's simple. You get more people working. Right? That's, 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 you know, nothing fancy here, boys and girls. Just, we're going to have more people working. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is, is that you need to change your bus line. Not more bus lines, just change where they go, right? That's all. And, and make it so that more people can get to work. That's what you're going to optimize. And that's what you t tell people about. More people are going to get to work, right? And uh, so that's the economic model. Um, th that's sort of the top down one. And, and, you know, as opposed to what happens today, which is, the city says, well, I don't know anything about this. I'll hire this consultant or this department that was set up 20 years ago, and they're going to optimize commute time. Yeah, OK, but what about all of those guys that don't have anything? Right? You know, uh, uh, that question doesn't get answered, asked. And part of it is because there's no way of knowing. You need the data to be able to say, look, here's this money. People. So in Senegal, for instance, we were able to rearrange their, in the capital city, we were able to rearrange their buses to be something like 10% more effective at zero cost. Just change the routes, you know. We're going to the wrong places. In, in Nigeria, we did something different. We had a, a local, uh, a guy who was from Nigeria, was an entrepreneur, and what he started doing is providing this information to their three-wheelers. So a lot of transportation are these three-wheel buses that hand the six, eight people, depends how many people you can jump on. Um, and, and of course, they go where they can make money. Right? And, and they go where everybody else goes because that's all they know. Right? There's no data. So by providing them with data about where there was untapped demand, they were each individual operator, because they're all individual, was able to make more money. He did a pretty good job of it. As far as I haven't tracked it in great detail, but he started and did pretty well to begin with. So um, those are examples of, of the value proposition, top down or bottom up. Right? Thank you. Tim, I guess you have a question. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> Hello, uh, Sandy. Thank you for the talk. Um, my name is Tim, and I work for a British Dutch recycling company. And basically what I, uh, I work as a data scientist and what I always notice during my work is that, so we're basically measuring from your basically your trash can 
till a new product, so from waste to product, the whole pipeline with data. And what I noticed during my work, there's a lot of heterogeneous data. So I cannot really say like what's, yeah, I cannot draw any conclusions out of it. So I'm sometimes also have the feeling that with data, we're trying to over engineer everything. And I'm wondering during your project in Australia, did you also notice that at certain moments, the, the data was too heterogeneous that you could not draw any conclusions out of it? Well, always there are places where you can't draw uh, a conclusion. Usually what that means is that the process is more complicated than your model. So for instance, and, um, I don't know this is what's happening in your company, but imagine that you just aggregated things across uh, large chunks of the city, right? Well, that includes very different areas. Uh, and the be it may be that the behavior of trash and recycling varies by, for instance, income level, or education level, or number of kids, or something that I can't imagine right at the moment, right? How they voted, right? Um, and uh, and if you included those things as stratifications, then you could perhaps find a real uh, predictive relationship. And it would tell you something about what you want to do also. It could tell you that, OK, here's these subgroups that uh, are behaving this way, and these groups are behaving that way. They need different value propositions, different marketing, so on and so forth. So, so you know, there's reasons for everything. Uh, it's just we may not have data that captures it, and we may not understand the causal processes or the correlative predictive processes. Uh, and yeah, this is this is the life of a data scientist, right? <laughs> the part that that um, social physics sort of pushes on is you should not consider people as individuals. Yes, people are individuals; they make choices, but they're very strongly uh, uh, influenced by the people around them and what those people do. Very strong. Often unconsciously. Are there trash bins? Are there recycling bins? Um, when you're having lunch with somebody, do they mention recycling just in passing? Right? I mean, that, make, that makes a huge difference, as it turns out. Right? And, and so it's these social networks that matter, not just the individual. And they're, they're almost equal in power, maybe, maybe more for things like trash. Uh, is the is the social? So you need to make sure you stratify it that way because different groups are different, just like different people are different. Right? Thank you, uh, Sandy. You will have to answer three questions in uh, six minutes. <laughs> Two minutes per okay. question. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Let's talking. Okay. Good. Victoria. Thank you. Hi, my name is um, Victoria, and uh, I'm building a, a, an urban inter intelligence platform with uh, my co-founders. So we are pretty much doing what you showed on the map of Australia, aggregating statistics, pulling in some other data, and visualizing it for decision makers. And I'm also a co-founder of uh, Ethical Mobility Cooperative in uh, Switzerland. And my idea, my question is related to that uh, because there we are basically trying to collect mobility data and handle it in an ethical way. So you can at some point build predictions and traffic systems without the Google data, without the telecom data that is sold to third parties. And this seems to have at least a vague use case around it. But the question is, what else? Uh, do you have some good examples for other urban developments? where it is more about the data collection, not using the available statistics, and how, um, how this example solved it that the people were incentivized to actually pledge their data to a good cause. Yeah. Uh, so often it's difficult to collect data. People don't like the idea of doing anything with data. So like you walk up to them and you say, Data, but and they stop hearing you. It's like, okay, you're evil, go away. Okay, that's their mental reaction. Um, and that's too bad. There are people who are able to do this. Like, if you look at patients like me, so what that is is a website where people could, people who have rare medical conditions that are life threatening, put their data in there. All this very private data because they're trying to learn from each other. 
things that doctors don't know. But it takes something like that, as like something that is urgent, it overcomes all other social norms before people will be really good about contributing data, at least in places like Switzerland. Turns out in Japan, you can do this pretty well. Uh, the Japanese will behave themselves, right? They'll actually do this, right? But not in the US, not in Europe. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. Which leaves you um, to talk to platforms. Now, there are platforms that um, don't do anything with personal data. So, for instance, there are platforms that only um, make visible uh, aggregates uh, of foot traffic to, uh, to stores. So, so this store has this many people coming into it, and it gets it off of cell phone data. You can do the same thing. The Visa and MasterCard, if you're a city, or somebody who's socially responsible, will give you data like that. They can just bring people who buy things. They won't tell you what they buy or who the people are, of course, right? But, um, you know, my attitude is, is that uh, what we need to do is we need to get started showing people and uh, value of data and putting value in, the, putting that in the hands of people. So instead of asking them to do something difficult and confusing and seems dangerous, tell them, look, let's form a cooperative to make better transportation. And what we're going to do is you're going to click that thing on Google that downloads your patterns, your mobility patterns. That's all you do, right? Uh, and what we're going to do is collect statistics from your data and throw your data away. We will not keep your data, okay? But what we will do is tell you where you should do X, Y, and Z, okay? And, and we've seen that work in a number of cases, like for his gig workers who want to know if, the, if they can make more money or they can, are being exploited. Uh, uh, truck drivers are interested in, you know, safety and, you know, are they being exploited? And so they're willing to combine data to be able to uh, you know, live their life better. And, and in those cases, it's, it's not that the data is maintained someplace else. It's that, that there's analytics that come off of their data from these platforms uh, that are aggregated to show them what they want to know. So that's the only things I've seen that really work. So I know that's not what you wanted to hear, probably. But we only uh, have no, I mean. It confirms what I also already know and what we figured out. So thanks for the insight. And I will definitely look at uh, Japan. Yeah. Well, no, it's just a cultural thing. Like Japanese like robots, too. Europeans <laughs> don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have, we have like no minutes left, but I'm, I'm here for another minute or two. Tanya, and then Omer, and then we're done. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm Tanya. I'm doing a PhD in TU Delft in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about governance and scale. So you, throughout the presentation, you kind of talked about how, you know, data unions and things like that can be more decentralized and that it shouldn't be, uh, decisions shouldn't be made uh, in a centralized way because one size fits none. And so yeah. I was wondering if you have any insights on, yeah, the, the, the correct or ideal scale of governance yeah. and who, so, so, uh, yeah, uh, go uh, ahead. The principle is a good scale, this is like a clustering problem, right? And the thing to realize is that you and your decision making and your life are a function of many different social networks. There's the healthcare network, there's the governance network, there's the employment network, friend network, there's your online network, right? And if you cluster those things, what you're going to end up getting, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, is something that look a lot like census blocks. There's a reason census blocks are the way they are. It's because the attitudes, the, the needs, the outcomes of the people are similar enough that when they did a clustering, these people all sort of like had a coherence. And, and so, so that's the thing that I like the best because 
it means that the people in your cluster share the same problems with you pretty much right and a policy that changes things in your cluster will probably be pretty good for you maybe a little more or less but it's better than the policy for the whole city so it turns out the census guys did a pretty good job as far as we can tell and of course they collect a lot of data that's useful for figuring out what communities ought to do so hey let's just start there right that's really cool thanks okay omer and then and then we'll all have to go i guess right yeah hi uh thank you for the presentation this is wonderful uh i'm omer i'm based in montreal and i look at the accessibility in metro stations in particular for people with disabilities so the uh, Atlas for Opportunities was a super cool tool. Uh, my first question is logistics. Is that possible to, uh, is it possible to have that Atlas for other cities as well? And then the second question is, um, I've, I heard you talk about clusters and communities and uh, aggregating the data, but how can we still um, look at the patterns for certain individuals and certain demographics that don't that are outliers in the general city so think about people with disabilities right so for those people should we be looking at outliers in the aggregate data or um you know aggregating data for each demographic groups like parents with strollers or people on wheelchairs blind individuals yeah so so uh we are working with other groups and we don't have the resources to do it for people but you know, we are helping people in Sao Paulo, we're helping people in Istanbul, uh, uh, in the US, of course, right? And so, yeah, it's, it's certainly open and available. Um, you know, we're a university and a not-for-profit, so if we put people on it, we have to pay our people, blah, 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 right? Um, <clears throat> interestingly, there's, we're helping people in Toronto do something, too, so I could, I know, I know Quebec and Ontario hate each other, but you know, it may be possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, for small groups, smaller outlier groups, um, the typical way people do it is you suspend the rules in a research setting, and you ask how you know with identified data, or not identified. It could be anonymized, but individual record anonymized. Mm -hmm. so that so top level thing everybody should remember, anonymized data doesn't exist, right? Basically, if you just anonymize each record, I can always re-identify that person by looking at other data. Just remember that, no such thing. However, it makes it really difficult if you have anonymized data, it's difficult to identify people. You have to try to break the law, right? And so, so anonymized data can be useful in a research setting because now you can look at things like that and ask how that compares to the flows and make a policy decision about what you want to do. You know, um, but it has to be in a carefully controlled setting where people are constrained legally, like you are in research, for instance, right? When you do research, you sign agreements and there's a whole protocol for making sure you don't like hurt people and stuff. And, and so in that protocol, you can use anonymized data at the individual level. But for a deployed system, you want to make sure that it's aggregate. Um, and I think every case is different, yes. Disability, kids are different too. Um, you know, on different issues, people who are just out of jail are different. <laughs> you know, elders are different. I mean, you know, so you have to sort of look at those special cases one-on-one, -on -one, I think, and decide. I don't have any general rule for that. But um, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Thank Good. you so much. Great. Thank you. All Thanks. good? Yeah, we are perfect. Thanks so much, Sandy, for taking the time to answer. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Sandy. Bye. Bye, um, to everyone, well, thanks uh, thanks for attending the, the session. We will have a collective intelligence session next Friday, uh, as Naila said it, and our next lecture will be next week, and this time it will be with Carlo Ratti from the MIT Sensible City Lab. Uh, if some of you want to stay in the session to talk about the lecture, you are more than welcome.